I probably don't need this. I'm used to booming in front of big classes. I get a little animated. Um, I'm going to take us on a journey. If you saw my uh, talk two years ago, this will be a big update and where we need to head now to, to save some of, some of the last uh, most endangered species on the planet. So um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about, about these animals. And, and we, we have all these beautiful uh, pictures of them. And, and they make us go, oh, and we, and we, we want to, to save them. But, but thinking about biodiversity and, and where we're headed in the world, um, I, I found this quote. And it, uh, biological diversity is messy. It walks, it crawls, it swims, it swoops, it buzzes. But extinction is silent. Um, just like, uh, just like that, that silent fade of those animals going away there. Um, and it has no voice other than our own right now. So um, we are literally living through the sixth mass extinction. And it's on us. Um, humans are 100% responsible. I'm going to take us down a little bit, but I swear to God, I'm going to bring you up at the end, OK? I'm going to get us there. Um, a recent paper just came out this summer, and I borrowed some graphics from The Guardian and gave them the credit there. Uh, but um, they were looking at the biomass of the entire planet. And, and we are now in a situation where 96% of all the alive mammals on the planet are our livestock and humans. And there's only 4% of wild animals. This is completely flipped in the last 2,000 years. Right? Um, they also came up with this number that 83% of all wild mammals have been lost since we became civilized. I'm not talking about 83% extinction rate, I'm the biomass. That's how much we've lost. You know, and marine animals, 80%, 50% of the plants. Um, something's got to change. So about four years ago, Panthera came into my office at the University of Montana and said, I have a problem. I got rangers in the field trying to do anti-poaching patrols. They're getting lost. Their GPSs won't pick up a signal under the jungle canopy. Um, can you help me make really high resolution topo maps? I said, I think so. Um, so he said, we have some serious problems with the big cats. Only 100 years ago, we had 100,000 tigers. Now we're down to about 3,900. It's like 96% loss. Um, 100,000 lions down to, or excuse me, cheetahs down to 7,100 now. You know, 93% loss. 200,000 lions are down to 20,000 in the wild. It's, it's, um, it's painful sometimes, these numbers. Uh, 30,000 down to 6,000 snow leopards. And that's a, a, a really rough estimate because they're very hard to count. You know, they're way up in the Himalaya. But um, at this point, there's more captive tigers in Texas than are alive in the wild. All right? And they live in like horrible conditions like truck stops and stuff. It's, um, so what do we really stand to lose by losing the big cats? Um, we lost a, 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 a big advocate for cats, Dr. Alan Robanovitz. He passed away this last spring, and he's the, the um, uh, founder of Panthera. And um, he said, you know, the energy on Earth with big predators is very, very different. It's a very different energy. It's this huge, positive, overwhelming force which humbles you and makes you realize there are things much greater than you on Earth. And this is true. These predators at the top of the um, food chain are key for healthy ecosystems. Recent research has really uh, made us think about trophic cascades and the way that these top predators actually affect everything below them. By reintroducing wolves into the Yellowstone ecosystem, we actually change the way that the rivers flow because they started to control the elk and the elk started to ma manage the vegetation and it changed the way that the rivers flow. So by leaving these animals in the ecosystem, it changes physical geography. Um, here's Pumpkin Earth in honor of Halloween. Um, we've got about 200,000 terrestrial protected areas in the world. I stripped off the other 15,000 marine areas here. Uh, but right now, it's estimated that less than 50% of them are mapped at an adequate scale for management. And that might uh, be different uh, depending on the park and what we're trying to manage. <clears throat> but we, we really are dealing with Pino, parks in name only. These are paper parks that are just a decree, right? And uh, we're, we're in a situation now where we're trying to catch up and we're trying to measure these places. And the first thing that needs to happen, most likely, in many of them, is mapping them. So um, to this end, Panthera, seven years ago, said we're going to do tiger forever sites, very specific sites where we know there's viable populations of tigers. And we're going to put people on the ground to stop the poaching. Because we have enough protected areas, 
But the um, encroachment by poaching is the number one killer of the big cats. And so they said, we're going to put people on the ground to stop it. So we first mapped Parsa Wildlife Refuge in Nepal. Um, then we took a look at Manus National Park in India. And right now, we're finishing up Kenya Taman Nagara, which is in Malaysia. And that is uh, literally coming off the presses today back in Montana. And my students are proofing it. And they will go in a tube and be on their way to, to Malaysia next week. All right. <clears throat> Um, Dr. Rob Pickles is the guy I work with on the ground. He's going to take my maps, take them into the field, and teach the rangers how to use them, and then go out and try and stop the poachers. And he's, he's very adamant that it would be a massive indictment against humanity if during our time tigers walked into extinction and we didn't prevent it. But he's hopeful that it's not at all too little or too late. It's working, and I'm going to show you some of our results here at the end. All right. First park, Parsa National Park. Um, we gridded it out at 16 map sheets, started looking for data, and realized there is none. So we were given uh, <clears throat> some DigiGlobe uh, half meter satellite imagery, and the students digitized every single feature you see here. They went through and they put a dot on every house, they digitized every trail, and in this particular map set, they also did the land cover. So um, a lot of work, it took us 10 months, students sitting behind the computers, uh, making it happen. In the end, we ended up only doing 13 map sheets, because uh, we ran out of time and money, so it didn't end up as a perfect square, but that's okay. Um, they were very successful. We got them into the rangers' hands. The guys were in the fields doing good work with it. And there is some great news to talk, tell you about Parsa here at the end. Um, we also take these maps and put them into digital um, files so they can be on GPSs, so when they do get out into the open, they can check their location. And then we create a, a mosaic of them all together, for, and they can put it in Google Earth, and they can use it for planning purposes back at headquarters. All right, next park we went to was Manus National Park. This is a really interesting park that's in the, the flatlands of, of India and Assam, and then actually crosses over the border into the foothills of the Himalaya in Bhutan. And um, uh, there's another park just across the border called the Royal Manus. Um, so <clears throat> this is what one of our map sheets looks like when it's finished. Again, we had to hand digitize everything, but we got a little bit smarter and we were able to generalize and pull the um, land cover out of Google Earth Engine which was very helpful. So the students went through, hand digitized every single thing, including over 5,000 fish ponds right here next to the river. <clears throat> Sorry about my voice. That's Nasus Night Out. Um, <clears throat> and then when we put them all together, we had this nice, big, beautiful, um, you know, all sheet map, ready to go. Took them over to India, gave them to the, uh, to the rangers. They did a big training with it. They were extremely happy with the maps. And the best part, they got in the field and they started using them. Uh, people, when, when your maps get into the wild, they do crazy things like get taped together, get the collars cut off, get printed on some strange printer, and the colors get all blown out. But it doesn't matter because they're there for one purpose, and that's to help these animals. Um, then we took a little side trip to um, Senegal. And Neil Colocobo had a gold mine that was going in uh, down there in the southeast, and they gave us some money to go ahead and, um, and help map the park for conservation. This, this park is massive, much bigger than the ones that we've done in the past. Um, in a different landscape, really interesting uh, you know, uh, topography. And again, we ended up with <clears throat> 20 map sheets on this one. Um, but they used them for a very different purpose. Turns out they didn't take the maps in the field as much. These rangers tend to do their patrols in their trucks. And so they just wanted the digital package um, out there. But they were using it to make new roads, and they used our data and our maps to make new roads. Um, so they actually put in a new ranger station and used all of our data. We also found about 100 salt pans that the rangers had no idea were there. And you can see one right here. They have a ranger station just over there and a salt pan that they'd never visited. They saw it on our map. They went out there and camped out and caught a, a team of poachers. It works. All right. So um, last one, the one we're just finishing up right now, is in uh, Kenya, in Malaysia. A very different problem. Palm oil plantations are just ripping through the landscape as fast as we can map it. We started getting uh, planet imagery, which is three meter imagery, about every three months. And by the time we get a new round of imagery, we'd have to redo our polygons for the palm plantations. Um, the roads that they leave behind are giving the poachers access into the jungle, and they're, they're in there getting, getting as many tigers as they can. The guys are chomping at the bit for the maps. They're in the field right now doing anti-poaching patrols today, guaranteed. There's, there's rangers sleeping in the field. 
Um, this is a proof that just came off of the presses just earlier in the week. It's a huge reservoir with all these islands. There's tigers on the islands. Tigers can swim big distances, very interesting. Um, anyways, should be really helpful. We're trying to, um, to get these things into their hands as fast as possible. So I did a little math. I know that's scary for geographers. Don't worry. It's just pluses and minuses. Um, Parsa Wildlife Reserve, Nepal, 13 map sheets. Um, Manus, we did 12 map sheets. Neocola Kobo, we did 20. <clears throat> and Kenya, we just finished up 24. That's 69 map sheets. And we did it in 208 weeks, which is four years, right? It's three weeks per map sheet. Wow, it's taking too long, right? Um, I did some quick numbers, just figure out how many map sheets I'd need to finish up just the Tiger Forever sites uh, at just over 56,000 square kilometers. It's 315 map sheets or 18 years. So there goes my career right there. Let's just get it done. Um, I talked to my, my grad student, Martin uh, Verkel. He just finished his master's. He documented this entire process. Um, we're hoping to release that as a, as a working document um, to the world soon. Um, but he's just ever the optimist. He's all, oh, so we just need to get it down to one map sheet a week, and we'll get this done in six years, no problem. I'm like, that's why I want to be around young people, because they just see it in a different way, all right? All right. But it's, it's an even bigger problem. Now Africa is calling. So the, the maps in Senegal are really popular. And, um, and there's some massive parks there. So we need to do 60 more map sheets just to finish out Neocolocoba. Um, Lope uh, gave us a call there in uh, Gabon. And they need, what, 45 map sheets? And then the, the, the big one, right? So we got a call from Angola for these two parks here. 1,150 map sheets. So at three weeks each, 72 years, no problem. I need like three careers. I need an army of student cartographers and a bucket of money, a big one, right? Um, this is making a lot of lions sad, right? They're not, it's, uh, plus Mozambique, Kenya, Tanzania, they're all calling right now. Uh, we need a new design, something's gotta give. So we've been looking at ways of fixing this. Um, I went back to the, to the uh, to the source and said, what are the purpose of these maps? What are we trying to do here? So it's to aid field navigation for anti-poaching, but it's in an unconnected environment. In many of these places, they're not getting very good GPS. Maybe they do get some, but they get no Wi-Fi and no cell phone service. Um, so some things are out, right? Um, facilitate the collection of data on poaching activity, all right? And to help rangers collect data on the animal population. So we're trying to really measure and see what's out there. So how can we meet these goals? Well. We're looking at loading rugged cell phones. We bought a really cool cell phone. This isn't it, but it's roughly the same exact size. It's called a Blackview 9000. It comes straight from China for 200 bucks. I thought, oh, this thing will never work. It's incredible. There's a great video online of the guys freezing a block of ice, throwing it off of a freeway overpass, lighting it on fire, throwing it in the water, and picking it up, turning it on. I was like, sold. That works. <laughs> Um, we want to use mobile GIS apps, you know, like a map PT and stuff. We would love to use Art Collector, but it's an unconnected environment. There's no time when they'll ever be online with these devices. Um, and then uh, integrate Bluetooth sharing between all of the different devices so that we can just move data back and forth up and down the chain. So let's take a look at that graphically. So the Rangers will be in the field with their mobile device, and it'll have satellite imagery. So I'm going to put you know, as many square kilometers of the planet imagery as I can on there. It'll have Cyber Tracker, Map PT, and then um, the, uh, the manager will have a bigger tablet, ruggedized, a lot more storage space. They can have a, a database of imagery that then they can give to the rangers for individual patrols. And then, of course, the analyst back in the, um, in the main office will have everything. It'll have the whole, the whole nine yards, right? Um, so the ranger goes into the field, picks up a track, goes out to the tree where they know they have a camera trap set up, and already Panthera has worked on putting Bluetooth on their camera traps, and so that just beams over um, a, a little image, says, hello, we found a tiger here, great. So now it's in, on, their, on their thing. They go back to their manager and they say, okay, here's, here's what we found today. But the manager knows other data from multiple days, like, okay, we know where two poaching camps were, and now they can make a decision. Do they turn around and make a new mission for the rangers and send them to intercept, or do they get it to the analysts? 
The analysts take a look at it and they say, we have all the information. We know where all the tigers are most likely. We know where all the bad guys are. Um, and we can go ahead and grid this out, you know, and say these are the places we need to really watch out for. And in the end, what we're hoping to do is send the, the rangers the data that says, you take this trail that we have modeled off the DEM with CircuitScape and Maxent and all these things, and put you between the, the, the poachers and the tigers, all right? So then that data just gets sent back down the chain, right? So ideally, what we would want to do is, is, uh, is try and make this, instead of a two-way circle, just a one-way. So we're looking to, to put on these uh, camera traps a satellite uplink. Problem is power, batteries, all these things. Maybe I'm going to have to go climb some trees and put a solar panel on the top. I'm game. Whatever. Let's do it. Let's make it happen, right? And then it can just come right back to the analyst, and we can just keep it going. Cool? All right. It works. We are, we are making huge strides towards saving these animals. Um, this is off of the Panthera's blog, and they just reported in the first park that we mapped a 19% increase in tigers in Nepal within four years. Right? They just got on film tiger cubs being born in Parsa for the first time in decades. Prepare for cuteness. Here we go. <laughs> oh, no. Denied cuteness. We're going back. What do I got to do to get that little video to play? Help me, help me. I'm trying, but. It's just, oh, and you went, ah. Well, so much for flow. That's okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I, I always have a backup because I'm a professor and I hate that when this happens to me and it happens all the time, so. Let's see what happens. It worked when we were playing over here. Aha, here we go. It's not my computer, but we're, get, we're getting there. It's all coming together. Oh, there's only 700 tabs open. <laughs> here they are. Oh, look at, there he is, little booger schmooger. Um, they say it's a really good sign because he's playing, right? And there's actually two of them, and they're jumping all over each other. Um, there, was, there was years and years and years where there was no tiger sightings at all in the Parsa Wildlife Reserve. So this is huge, huge news for everyone, and we're very, very pleased. Um, so that's that one. Let's see here. Um, tiger, since I started doing this project, we started with 3,200 uh, being counted in the wild today. We are up to uh, 3,900 or maybe even 4,000. So let's see that, that their graphic's going to show up. There it is. So it's, it's happening. We're taking care of these animals, and we're getting, we're getting a better count. This might be just because we're counting them better, but it's all part of the, the, the program. I'd like to take all the credit for it and just say the maps did it. But you know, I think it's a team effort. Everybody's, everybody's doing good stuff. All right? So. In Manus National Park, um, there was just an op-ed by the new uh, director of Panthera, right? And um, so he's basically saying that there, seven years ago, there was no tigers countable in, in Manus. Now there's 30 tigers there. We're looking at 50% increases in just a few years with our maps. Um, they're capturing cubs on the camera traps in Manus National Park. And, and he's very right when he says the results here prove that focused efforts on locking down these key tiger sites can increase these populations. It works, okay? All right. So, let's see what Dr. Rob Pickles has to say. This, this young man has some of the best mutton chops you'll ever see in the wild. Man, you know what it is? It's the way I know what to do, sorry. I have a plan. No, I don't have a plan. <laughs> and no sound. But okay, so I'm going to give you some. We'll just have to read it. Sorry, you guys. Okay, so uh, they detected a, a female tiger. She's moving through the corridors in, in Malaysia. And um, that's, this is in the, in the exact place that we're mapping. And so what they're saying is basically we have to keep 
the pressure on to protect this cat because if we can make sure that she moves from one key source population down to a net, another one, then they can hopefully hook up together and they can get a mating pair. So it's, um, it's one of those things where you, when, you, when you realize that just by putting a little bit of extra effort in protecting the animals in their environment, you end up with a situation that can cause exponential results, right? You start to really have some key successes. So um, Rob's really, really happy, but his, his basic point is every single tiger counts. Every one that we can keep is gonna, is gonna help us, okay? All right, so. Now can I switch this back? Jeez. Sorry, everybody. Doesn't happen to me too often anymore, but every once in a while. All right. So where are we head next? It's almost over. Uh, future work. So satellite uplink for the camera traps. That would be awesome. Real-time threat analysis and ranger dispatch. Um, global database of satellite imagery for, for Panthera. So we want to be able to have these guys just be able to, to get all the data they need whenever they need it. Microsoft, National Geographic Artificial Intelligence for Earth program. We have to find a way to make the data faster. Really intrigued with uh, uh, that uh, article that just came out in the New York Times with all the buildings in the United States. We need something that can do that for us and grab the, 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 the features that we are making by hand, basically. And what about like a wiki range map crowdsourced? Let's put the world out there. If they love tigers, they love lions, whatever. Make the data for us. Help us get these maps out faster, right? And then ultimately, I just kind of follow the, the president's lead. If I say it enough times, it becomes true. UM Center for Conservation and Cartography and GIS, right? Um, and we're already working with snow leopards now in Bhutan. And I just want to thank you guys for coming today. Uh, I want to thank the University of Montana, Panthera, Dr. Hugh Robinson with Panthera, uh, Dr. Than Robinson at UM, and all of my great, talented, awesome, committed students that make it possible. <laughs>